this time, it's my pleasure to welcome our speaker today, um, Dr. Tom Strawman. He is professor of English, former chair of the English department, and one of our Buchanan professors here at Middle Tennessee State University. He studied at Iowa State and the University of Kansas before completing a PhD in comparative literature at the University of Washington. Dr. Strawman has taught a wide range of courses over, over a 25 plus uh, year career uh, at MTSU and at the University of Kansas. He's taught composition, British Romanticism, Native American literature, um, modern European literature, surveys in British literature, research methodologies, and all kinds of things in between. He's presented numerous papers at academic conferences on Native American literature and eco-critical approaches to fiction and poetry. He's published over 30 articles in the regional land preservation newsletter, Friends of South Cumberland State Park. And most recently, he contributed an excellent chapter on Henry David Thoreau and the Principle of Passive Resistance, which was published in Prison Narratives from Boethius to Zana, a collection that arose from our 2012 Honors Lecture Series on prison writing. So please join me today in welcoming Dr. Strawman. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Oops, especially after uh, uh, having it postponed, uh, I think we were scheduled uh, first on February 16th, and you all remember that's when the ice uh, hit so uh, powerfully. Um, so uh, it's nice to be here and enjoying a little warmer April weather. Um, I thank you all for your interest in Native American cultures, the topic for the um, lecture series this semester and for your attendance today and I, I hope you'll discover uh, something in my remarks today that may be of value or interest. So the title for my lecture, uh, Beyond the Human, Non-Human Divide, uh, Cultivating Ecological Imagination in Louis Erdrich's The Last Report on the Miracles at Little No Horse, uh, may require just a little bit of uh, decoding if you're not already familiar with uh, the extraordinary literary output of what critic Kenneth Lincoln has called the Native American Renaissance. Uh, that outpouring of serious and critically acclaimed writing in all genres by American Indians since the 1960s. So there's been tremendous outpouring of uh, writing in the past half uh, century. Uh, that Kenneth Lincoln calls Native American Renaissance. In particular uh, is the unique contribution uh, made to this rebirth by Ojibwe writer Louise Erdrich, and she wrote the novel that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, born in 1954 to a German-American father and an Anishinaabe uh, mother enrolled in the Turtle Mountain Ojibwe reservation. Uh, this is near the Canadian border in the center of North Dakota. Uh, Louise Erdrich remains an enrolled member of this tribe and makes her home in the Twin Cities, uh, where she owns and operates birch bark books uh, and native arts, working there with a spirited collection of uh, people who, according to its website, believe in the power of good writing um, the beauty of handmade art, the strength of native culture, and importance of small and intimate bookstores. Perhaps the most widely popular of many contemporary American Indian writers today, Erdrich is the author of 14 novels, as well as volumes of poetry, short stories, children's books, and a memoir of early motherhood. Her novel, The Roundhouse, won a National Book Award in 1912, or 2012, I'm sorry. Uh, in recent years, she has given several readings in Nashville and um, the Middle Tennessee area. My chief aim today 
is to present the argument that Louise Erdrich, contemporary Ojibwe poet and novelist, uh, has used her writing in part uh, to uh, create characters who embody and model what I've chosen to call an ecological imagination. Uh, indebted to linguist and translator Gerald Ramsey's first use of the concept in the 1980s, uh, my contention is that her novel, uh, The Last Report on the Miracles at Little No Horse, uh, which was named a National uh, Book Award finalist in 2001, uh, contains a protagonist whose extraordinary life is expressly created to illustrate how an ecological imagination might uh, be cultivated by overcoming the human, non-human binary upon which the ascendancy and dominance of Western civilization is based. Uh, before turning to the novel, I'd like to give you uh, some basic information about the Ojibwe people. Uh, occupying Indian reservations and First Nations reserves today from Quebec in the east uh, to Sask Saskatchewan in the west, uh, and along the northern tier of the U.S. from Michigan to Montana, the Ojibwe are spread across the largest swath of land area uh, inhabited today by any Aboriginal culture group in North America. Uh, they constitute the second largest language group in Canada and fourth largest in the United States. Anishinaabe is the native Ojibwe word that means first or Aboriginal people. And it is the word that this Algonquian speaking uh, group uh, <clears throat> it's the word that they use to refer to themselves uh, as a cohesive culture and a collective we. With linguistically bound uh, cultural identity, uh, the Ojibwe share a common religion, uh, cosmology, and creation story, uh, the same myths, a similar history, and the common memory and practices of a woodland uh, economic structure that anthropologists would term hunting and gathering. This linguistic and material culture maintained them for thousands of years as a vital and thriving group until the land was finally taken away and they were forced to settle in the late 19th century on tiny islands of land uh, surrounded by an invading colonial culture of Anglo-Europeans. Following this loss of the old freedom uh, to pursue a subsistence economy, um, the Ojibwe people were forced to compete among themselves for vastly reduced resources. American encroachment on their eastern lands after the French-Indian War uh, in the 18th century forced the Ojibwe who lived at uh, the time of European contact on the southern and western shores of the Great Lakes to begin a protracted westward migration. Uh, this long displacement lasted for more than 100 years and brought them eventually as far west as Saskatchewan and Montana. Although Erdrich grew up in uh, Wapaton uh, in North Dakota on the massive uh, Red River, uh, eventually earning a BA at Dartmouth and MFA at Johns Hopkins University, her mother uh, grew up among the descendants of those southwestern Ojibwe who had moved west from their old homes near Lakes Erie, Huron, and Michigan, settling in Wisconsin or fighting the eastern woodland Sioux across Minnesota to the middle of North Dakota, uh, where they found lakes and northern forests similar to those they had left behind. This group and others who straddle the Canadian border across the upper Midwest are still called Meti, uh, the French word for mixed blood. Having entered into the fur trade with the, fr with the French beginning in the 17th century on the Great Lakes, they developed feelings of strong mutual affection and empathy with the French, who, unlike the British, did not hold an unshakable conviction uh, of cultural superiority. 
and Ojibwe women frequently intermarried with French trappers, uh, traders, and government officials, as the many French surnames and place names today among Ojibwe people in this region attest. As a result, the Metis accepted Catholicism when Christianized, absorbed French words and phrases into their own language, transformed their material culture from wood and stone to manufactured steel tools and weapons, adopted the jigs, uh, fiddles, and dances of the North Atlantic maritime French culture, and developed a serious and often debilitating dependence on alcohol. Uh, this land in central North Dakota along the Canadian border eventually became uh, the much reduced land base uh, called the Turtle Mountain Indian Reservation. Erdrich came to know this place well and used it as the essential setting for many of her novels. As uh, she writes in the end notes to the last report, uh, Ojibi Iganan, the reservation depicted in this and in all my novels is an imagined place consisting of landscapes and features similar to many Ojibwe reservations. This imagined place in North Dakota she calls Little No Horse, a place name she uses for the first time in this novel. As we learn from the marvelous and abundant stories that fill her novels uh, set at Little No Horse, the local Ojibwe, whose family lives and interactions she depicts over several generations spanning across more than 100 years, uh, have long been consummate hunters and gatherers, uh, possessing an impressive knowledge of the mixed conifer deciduous forest and its many resources uh, that enabled them to survive uh, abundantly through centuries of long and severe northern winters. As uh, Robert Ritzenthaler writes in the Handbook of North American Indians, uh, wood was used to make utensils, implements, and weapons. Birch bark served as wigwam coverings, storage containers, and the skin of their canoes. Inner barks were used, basswood for bag weaving and twine, cedar for mat making, and willow for kinnikinnik, which was smoked with their tobacco. The sugar maple was tapped for sap that was converted into sugar. Uh, nuts, berries, and fruits were gathered. A great variety of medicine was concocted from roots, stems, and leaves of local flora. So they had it all. The many lakes and rivers also provided abundant fish, a rapid means of water transportation, and copious wild rice fields. Uh, while the cattails and bulrushes that grew along the many shorelines and sloughs provided fiber for woven mats to floor inside their wigwam homes. Uh, with this cultural and historical background at work in everything that Louise Erdrich writes, the last report on the miracles at Little No Horse is no exception. It extends and deepens the stories and characters of the Turtle Mountain Ojibwe Reservation in North Dakota that she has used repeatedly as the setting of many novels since 1983. Uh, but the last report departs from them in singular fashion by focusing on a protagonist uh, who is Euro-American and not part of a First Nations culture. Characteristically enough, Erdrich chose to tell the strange and wonderful story of Father Damien Modeste and his work at Little No Horse. A sympathetic Catholic priest, he was first introduced in 1988 in her novel Tracks, having arrived at the Ojibwe Indian Reservation in North Dakota in 1912. Oddly naive in his outsider, outsider status, yet uh, loving and kind in the early novel, he is developed fully in this second one, uh, which spans the years 1910 to 1996. He is still a white outsider, but one who possesses an unusually deep emotional and spiritual capacity, uh, not only to acknowledge the strength, beauty, and humanity of Ojibwe culture, uh, but actually to embrace and enter it fully as an integrated participant. In creating this story, Erdrich borrows elements and tropes uh, from early American captivity narratives. 
Uh, Mary Rowlandson's memoir from 1682 is considered the source and pattern of all subsequent ones. Uh, yet rather than develop Damien's Christian faith inside a pagan culture and celebrate his fortitude in withstanding the fierce savagery of his barbarous captors, that's the typical uh, storyline of the captivity narrative, uh, <coughs> Erdrich uh, inverts this narrative and tells the story of the Catholic father's gradual assimilation to Ojibwe manners and worldview. He displays no staunch hatred of heathenism, uh, no steadfast defense of the one true faith, but rather a slow and appreciative conversion from Christianity to an expansive spiritual view that amalgamates both Catholic and Ojibwe religious beliefs. Syncretism, as many Indian writers have insisted, is what Native peoples in the Americas have practiced for centuries to protect themselves and their beliefs against the militant efforts of Christian missionaries. As Ann Scott Mamaday so famously put it in the 1968 Pulitzer Prize winning novel, House Made of Dawn, uh, from 1968 about the San Imez Pueblo in northeastern uh, New Mexico, northwestern New Mexico, I should say. Uh, their invaders were a long time conquering them. And now, after four centuries of Christianity, they still pray in Tanawan to the old deities of the earth and sky. They have assumed the names and gestures of their enemies, but have held on to their own secret souls. And in this, there is a resistance and an overcoming, a long outwaiting. In a steady process of education and free choice, Father Damien arrives eventually at a position in which the universe is no longer divided into such irreconcilable opposites as light and dark, Christian and pagan, male and female, spirit and flesh, human and non-human. No longer is the cosmos at war with itself, nor is the human creature exceptional in the natural world, superior to all other creatures and in possession of the divine sanction to subjugate everything in nature to a masculine patriarchal will. Instead, Father Damien adopts a pan-Indian acknowledgement of relationship, kinship, and reciprocity with all that is not human. Respecting such kinship between the human and non-human worlds and feeling bound by an ethical or religious obligation to the non-human constitutes what I'm calling ecological imagination in this novel. As Lakota scholar of treaty law and religious studies, Vine Deloria Jr. asserts in God is Red, Indian cultures are imbued by a deep religious conviction that all inanimate entities have spirit and personality and that the mountains, rivers, waterfalls, even the continents and the earth itself have intelligence, knowledge, and the ability to communicate ideas. The physical world is so filled with life and personality that humans appear as one minor species without much significance and badly in need of assistance from other forms of life. In his growing knowledge of these concepts on the Ojibwe reservation, Father Damien gets beyond the human-non-human divide. And instead of the reductive either-or binary, finds a great continuum, a gradual and infinite scale of incremental possibilities. In, the, in his study of traditional oral liter literatures of Indians in the Western United States, linguist and translator Gerald Ramsey identifies the same awareness of spiritual presence in the natural world that Deloria describes in the oral stories of the upper Chinookan hunting cultures of eastern Oregon. 
He was the first to call the intuition of this presence in nature ecological imagination. And he defines it, based on his analysis of his Chinookan materials, as an ethical sense of man's beholden place in the natural world and a radical recognition that we belong to the biosphere more than it belongs to us. The idea of religious conversion is introduced early in the novel, and its motivation seems strange and often selfish and hypocritical to the Ojibwe. When Father Damien first arrives on the reservation, he is brought in a horse cart by Cashpaw, the first Indian Father Damien has ever met. Along with the priest, Cashpaw had picked up 18 sacks of horse grade oats to be distributed among twice as many Indian families, uh, their only food until winter would finally break. Answering the priest's naive question, what can be done, Cashpaw advocates a return to the old ways as better than the constant hunger on the reservation. And he frankly advises Damien to leave us full bloods alone. Let us be with our Nana Bojo, our sweats and shake tents, our grand medicines and bundles. We don't hurt nobody. Our world is already whipped apart by the white man. Why do you black gowns care if we pray to your God? The next day, Father Damien meets the head nun in the convent who clearly assumes the superiority of Catholic beliefs and the urgency of saving Indians from their fallen state. The poor Indians are dying out, she says. Now is a good time to convert them. They live like wretches anyway, and then the sweating fever takes them. They just sit patiently, singing, drumming, and prepare to get sick. You could easily baptize them while they're tranced. For the mother superior at Little No Horse, giving Indians a choice, a chance to elect their beliefs based on personal decision or cultural preference or even a worthy example, is clearly not the way to deal with childlike creatures who seem unable to take care of themselves. Why not just take advantage of them when they're down if it means saving their souls? Old Nana Push, a full-blood elder at Little No Horse, embodies in surprising and often quite funny ways the qualities of Nana Bosho, the Ojibwe trickster figure and culture hero. He also performs the functions of religious leader or shaman for this boreal woodland hunter-gatherer group. Nanapush is another one of the first Indians Father Damien meets uh, when he visits his cabin on the second day of his tenure, worried that Nanapush uh, hadn't been seen for some time since hunger and consumption had recently begun to ravage the reservation. This scene early in the novel reinforces the Indian reaction to religious conversion as strange, even incomprehensible. Perhaps the Indians reason the missionary spirit is only another aspect of the same white greed they demonstrated for Ojibwe land and furs. Nana Push immediately raises the issue of the priest's mission at the reservation by telling him a story about Nana Bosho, the culture hero and trickster fool of many Ojibwe stories, after whom Nana Push himself was named. Conceived, no doubt, by the storyteller, especially for Father Damien, it is clearly a post-contact tale. Uh, for it tells how Nana Bosho, who says he had taken the Jesus road, uh, set about converting his brothers, the wolves. When the old trickster learns that a Frenchman is willing to trade food and clothing for animal skins, he buys poison on credit, uh, mixes it with some fat, and gathers the wolves and foxes so he can preach to them. He tells them that if they accept this religion, no one will kill them. But if they don't believe, they will die. He then shows them the fat balls and says, if anyone eats of this, long will he live. Of course, the wolves and foxes all want a long life. So Nana Bosho 
dispenses the food in this mock communion. Blessing them, he proclaims, long may you live. And as he said this, the wolves leaped in the air and howled, turned twice in their agony and fell back to earth, dead. That's the way Nana Bosho gave religious instructions to the wolves, old Nana Push concludes. After he saved their souls, he skinned them, walked to the French traders, and laughed and laughed. Truly, he said, I have converted them to money. The good father's response that he didn't think the Ojibwe were as stupid as the wolves and that he didn't need to skin them to pay his debts impressed old Nana Push, who began to look forward to the challenge of rattling a promising opponent. <clears throat> uh, however, the psychology of spiritual conversion Erdrich presents here is focused on the benefit to the missionary, while the conventional Christian focus is always on the need to bring salvation to the pagan, not on the eternal reward for those who convert people to Jesus. In this, as in all social interactions, the Nanapush character in his trickster role seeks to challenge and test others and bring them uh, to reflection and self-awareness if they are foolish. Father Damien shows himself here to be an equal uh, to uh, Nanapush's wit and emotional intelligence, and they soon become friends. But how did Damien begin on this path of soft conversion uh, toward the imaginative vision that sees everything in the world as interconnected and mutually dependent on all the various parts of the whole? To an unusual degree, Father Damien Modeste arrived at the Ojibwe settlement at Little No Horse with many gifts and insights unusual for a Catholic priest. First and foremost, he was not trained as a priest, uh, but instead began his religious training as a nun in a convent. In the fir very first scene of the book, Damien is seen in the present, 1996, now well over 100 years old, working late at night, his best hours, writing another in a lifelong succession of letters to several popes. This is his fourth. Having never received a response from any of them, he writes, uh, rather as in Kafka's imperial message, under some duress. Your Holiness, I speak to you from a terrible distance. I have so much to tell you and so little time. A desperate gravity has hold of me these days. I am sure that my death must at last be near. Dare I hope, since this will be the last of my reports, that at long last you will see fit to answer. In the course of this last letter or report to which the title of this novel alludes, Damien admits there is uh, one sin he needs to confess about himself before he dies. And he writes on for several hours before finally undressing for bed. Although the secret Father Damien confesses to the Pope is not shared with the readers. Erdrich reveals that after turning off the bedside lamp, the elderly priest sat in the moonlighted dark and unwound from his chest a wide ace bandage. His woman's breasts were small, withered, modest as folded flowers. Thus, on page eight of this novel, the author outs Father Damien who has spent his entire professional life as a Catholic priest in disguise. <clears throat> uh, hiding the fact that he is really a woman. No doubt Damien's Tiresias-like dual perspective that provides a continuum of thoughts, feelings, and intuitions ranging between male and female alerts her to the impossibility of an identity grounded simply in one or the other. That truth of intermediacy transfers readily to the entire range of binaries so dominant in Western thought. 
The spirit flesh binary upon which celibacy in the Catholic Church is grounded had obviously come to make no sense to Father Damien in her life and experience. In defending the nuns of her convent as robust women full of juice against the visitor, Father Jude, who is shocked that they might have been involved in sexual scandal in their lives, Damien responds reflectively, I prefer to call such incidents profound exchanges of human love. Mary Cashpaw was one, in fact, whom love did call. She acted upon her passion. After all, we live on earth. We're created of the earth. The Ojibwe word for the human vagina is derived from the word for earth. A profound connection, don't you think? Surprised to hear the word vagina used so freely by such an elderly man, Father Jude is quick to defend the proposition that certain norms of behavior are taken for granted. Right. Wrong. These are simply distinguished. Black is black and white is white. The mixture is gray, Damien responds and adds, anything of a large nature will create problems. The priest's job is to understand it, she says, not to judge. Indeed, Father Damien is no ordinary priest. His unhampered and relative view of human behavior makes him enjoy confessions more than any other sacred uh, sa or blessed sacrament. As the narrator observes, he enjoyed hearing sins, chewing over people's stories, and then with a flourish, absolving and erasing their wrongs, sending sinners out of the church clean and new. He forgave with an exacting kindness, but completely, and prided himself in dispensing unusual penances that fit the sin. People appreciated his interest in their weaknesses, as well as sense of compassionate justice. This fervent desire to give what he can, his love, understanding, forgiveness, his desire for reciprocity, for give and take, for sharing the burden of human weakness and failure, as well as fostering the courage to start over again, betrays Father Damien's Ojibwe spiritual orientation, in which all these diverse elements of the universe, whether human or non-human, are alive with interconnections, networks, and interchanges of power, intelligence, spirit, mutual regard, support, and love. As a young and passionate woman, Agnes DeWitt assumed the identity of Father Damien, uh, whom she found dead, drowned, and hanging from the limb of a tree that was caught in an eddy of the flood-ravaged Red River. Before deciding to assume his identity, she had been in a convent and renamed Sister Cecilia as a novitiate in this nunnery in Minnesota. Taking the name of the patron saint of music, Sister Cecilia not only taught but lived music and existed in her essence when at the keyboard playing Brahms, Beethoven, Debussy, Schubert, and Chopin. She was aware early on of the paradox of her existence, for every one of the yellow bricks used to construct the convent hauled halfway across Minnesota by devout teamsters bore the stamped word Fleisch from the brickworks that manufactured them, a German word meaning flesh. Thus, the fulfillment of spiritual longing that her tastes in 19th century romantic music and her religious aspirations both accommodate is fully lived out through her sturdy and ardent physical person, a body possessing sublime consciousness and intense feelings, a miniature but complete world made of flesh. Just as her spirit was expressed poignantly through her flesh, so her spiritual belief was expressed less in scripture, 
the rationalized uh, masculine set of laws, doctrines, commandments set in written words, uh, and more in the pre-rational intuitive language of music. Thus, the verbal nonverbal binary that was traditionally empowered, uh, that has traditionally empowered scriptural scriptural cultures over oral traditions and Christianity over all other religions held little sway in Agnes's early life. Her duties as a teacher and novitiate at the convent were not interrupted by her music, but the intense longing evoked in the nuns when she played it became a distraction. Chopin played simply, Erdrich writes, devastates the heart. Sometimes a pause between the piercing sorrows of minor notes made a sister scrubbing the floor weep into the buckets where she dipped her rags so that the convent's boards washed in tears seemed to creak now in a human tongue. The air of the house thickened with sighs. One day, her playing of Chopin built such an exquisite agony in building and release, building and release, that in her innocence, she didn't know she was experiencing a sexual climax, but thought it was simply the natural outcome of this piece played to the utmost of her abilities. And so it came to be that Chopin's spirit became her lover producing excruciatingly exquisite sensations the more she played. The mother superior finally intervened and banned her music when she herself awoke one day, bathed in tears and sweat to the largo of Chopin's prelude in E minor, music that brought back her emotions at the death of her mother and caused her to rage all day against the God who took a mother from a seven-year-old child. Until by evening, she felt fury steaming from the hot marrow of her bones and stopped herself, begging God's forgiveness. Prohibiting the language of her soul, soul soon drove Agnes from convent life, uh, but eventually brought her to Little No Horse. From an early age, Agnes recognized that her language of passion expressed through the spirit of music clearly challenges the hegemony of the verbal and the scriptural in the West, defined both its rationality and its sacred law. Once at Little No Horse, Agnes participated in many Ojibwe religious ceremonies which were governed by a religious belief in animal ceremonialism, uh, in the powers to be sought and gained from guardian spirits, uh, and in the shamans. The Ojibwe hunting culture relied on these beliefs and experienced them as efficacious because they supply, supplied them abundantly with moose, elk, bear, wolf, fox, and deer for both food and clothing. Oke Holtkrantz, noted Swedish anthropologist and authority on Indian religions of the Americas, defines animal ceremonialism as the rituals around the slain game. <clears throat> in particular, the disposal of the carcass whereby the bones are laid in their anatomical order and the head is sometimes elevated on a tree or pole. The ceremonialism is intended to propitiate the animal or its spiritual master uh, who is supposed to have been offended by the killing. The order of the bones objectifies the wish that the slain animal may rise again in this world or the next one. Pervasive among <coughs> indigenous hunting peoples throughout the Americas is a belief in animalism the conviction that a mysterious relation exists between animals and human, humans and is manifested according to Holtkrantz in the idea of spirits in animal forms. Coming into a ritualized, uh, ritualized relationship with these spirits and maintaining reciprocal relations with all the animals 
uh, whether spiritual or physical, was the duty and obligation of every hunter. Success in hunting depended crucially on one's religious attitude, uh, propitiating the spiritual forces in nature and honoring the kinship and humans have with the natural world around them. In one of the first such ceremonies Agnes attended, Nanapush presided in a small sweat lodge of his own construction. A staunch traditionalist, though educated at a Jesuit school, Nanapush reminds Agnes that this is our church. Then he began to pray, addressing the creator of things and all beings to every direction and every animal in a church that held him close upon the earth and intimate with fire, with water, with the heated air that clean, cleansed their lungs and with the earth below them and with the eagle's nest of the sweat lodge over them. As Nanapush, uh, as his invocation indicates, humans belong to the earth, its creatures, and all its elemental forces just one part of a magnificent, sentient whole. Although she felt a pang of transgression because according to Catholic Church doctrine, it was wrong for a priest to undertake God's worship in so alien a place, she reflected that its immediate and long-term effect was to spirit her away from her self-destructive anxiety and bring her to peace. And in this heathen worship, Agnes found herself comforted. Her felt experience in this larger world of Ojibwe ceremonialism seems right to Agnes and gradually replaces the Christian pagan binary in her worldview. Emerging out of Agnes's acceptance of earth-centered religious ritual, her plan to build a new church at Little No Horse serves as a climax to the debate over forced and voluntary religious conversion and her full acceptance by the community as a person of power. Replacing the old log structure that contained but a single window and was tightly closed to the elements, uh, she, <coughs> uh, she banishes this patriarchal house of the fathers in favor of a high, open structure sited directly on a long, flat slab of rock that rose abruptly at a steep angle to form a craggy cliff. Two stoves would be placed directly on the rock floor, uh, and as they warmed, the rock would absorb the heat and toast the feet of the worshipers. The cliff behind would be carved and polished and become part of the altar, a most incredible grotto that people would flock to see. When the new church was finally realized, she included the battered piano from the old church, although she had not played since her convent days before being swept away by the flood. In a moment of quiet solitude, as she admired the new church, she thought to try the keys and shyly began to play the secret contradictory melody of the pathétique, soon becoming absorbed in her plane and the powerful inner emotion it caused. Only gradually did she become aware that she had attracted a listener. Thinking it a stray nun or curious Ojibwe, she paid little attention until suddenly a twist of movement uh, from the corner of her eye caused her to look down at the rock floor and there Agnes saw the snakes who responded readily to the moods of her romantic program. The Rhapsody woke them, Debussy drew them forth, Chopin made them listen, and Schubert put them back to sleep. Numbering a hundred or more, the snakes became restive when Agnes quit playing and relaxed when she played on. A crowd of Indians gathered outside to see the spectacle, but growing weary, Agnes finally began to repeat Schubert's piece, sleep repeatedly, the snakes eventually slithering back to their underground lairs, those creatures D.H. Lawrence famously called the lords of the underworld. The opening of the church, the sudden return of Father Damien's piano virtuosity, but especially the regard of the snakes for his playing brought him much attention and new respect on the reservation. 
He played the piano on the first four Sundays of the new church's opening instead of giving sermons. And the snakes were present on the periphery of the gathered congregation. Preaching in musical language, Agnes spoke to human and non-human alike and united them together in a single congregation. Old Nana Push was especially excited and told Father Damien that this was a sign of great positive concern among the old people. For the snake was a deeply intelligent, secretive being and knew all the cold and blessed spirits who lived under stone and deep in the earth. And it was the great snake wrapped around the center of the earth who kept things from flying apart. After the snakes, Damien was gratified to find that he was consulted more often and trusted with intimate knowledge. These signs of attention uh, and regard, both from human Ojibwe and non-human creatures, signal Agnes's full acceptance into the Indian world as well as a gain in the power and growing comprehension of her ecological imagination. This singular preaching to the lords of the underworld, an unmistakable allusion uh, to the reductive fear and revulsion toward the snake in the binary Christian world, should remind us of St. Francis of Assisi, a patron saint of animals whose sermons to the birds are a significant historical reminder uh, that compassion for the non-human parts of nature exist in Christianity, but uh, seldom ex acknowledged as uh, they should be. In the novel's final word on religious conversion, Father Damien has already died. Uh, the sisters at the convent have just plugged in their first fax machine. This is 1996. The gift of an anonymous donor. The machine sputters immediately, the first message arriving from the Vatican. Ironically, it contains a commendation of Father Damien, the first response to a life of letters to the Pope. It reads, your love for the people in your care is a joyful statement of your faith. May you abide happily in their return of your affection and pass your days now in pleasant contemplation of all the good you have accomplished. And as, Father, uh, as the Pope's words attest, Father Damien's life has been focused not on conversion of souls uh, for the Christian afterlife, but simply and purely on love for the people in his care and love uh, for all the mysterious world that contains them. Thank you. Yes. Um, forgive the uh, binary reading, but is there any reference to the Asian spirit sculpture uh, that she from one of your uh, first people of Christ? I know that they had different names for them because they were the Navajo. The twins? The two, two spirits? Two spirits inhabiting the same body? Was the way shamanistic? Uh, not, not so much in this one, no. But. No, not in this one. But uh, uh, Nanapush certainly has the, the culture, the heroic and the foolish. Uh, both of those are embodied in his character. But I, I think you're talking about something else. Well, there's a, there's a, I'm generalizing, extremely generalizing, but there's a belief that more than well, one spirit can inhabit, like a, a tree can be female and I don't think so. She's more about sort of integrating the opposition in this one. Uh, well, uh, her, 
Her novel writing is very interesting. It's, it's, uh, it's rather like uh, family sagas. So she follows uh, maybe five or six principal families on this reservation over the period of, uh, well, a hundred years. Um, uh, Nana Push is 50 in 1912, so he would have been born in uh, uh, 1862 at the time when the uh, Ojibwe were coming across going out west. And, and the reason that the Ojibwe were displaced from the Great Lakes area is that they had become so dependent on trade with the French, the, the French only wanted furs, and pretty soon this sort of, uh, uh, well, the medium of exchange as furs soon depleted the animals from from the Great Lakes area. And so in order to keep up their trade with the French, they had to keep moving westward. Uh, but in one of uh, Nana Push's memories, uh, he experiences a, a really horrendous buffalo kill. You probably know that the uh, bison were uh, more or less exterminated in the 1870s by, uh, well, white gentlemen, <clears throat> like millions and millions. And uh, it was sort of unspoken truth that the last free Indians relied on the bison uh, for their lifestyle, for their economy, and so just exterminating them. And they hired buffalo skinners to go out. They just left the carcasses rotting on the ground. So uh, in one vision, or one night that uh, Nana Push had to live through, uh, all of the bison weren't killed, but enough of them were that they started ripping the flesh out of the carcasses and started ripping their own flesh because they had a sense that the end was, was here. Um, and these visions actually of uh, the end of animals uh, uh, crop up in several of the novels written by uh, Native Americans from several different groups. Um, so to them, the coming of the whites meant sort of the death of the animal world uh, as they knew it. <clears throat> yeah. minority choosing to convert to um, a, a dominant role, the role of you know, the lynch or dog. There's yeah. a significance there in the case. Well, one of uh, Agnes's early sensations is that when she's dressed as a man, pe <coughs> people pay her more respect. Mm -hmm. And listen to what she has to say. And so there is a little bit of this. Um, critiquing of gender in the white world that I think we uh, don't find to the same degree in most native cultures. Um, there, uh, people emerge as leaders within the group, whether male or female, according to the, the group's needs. So sometimes we need a spiritual advisor, sometimes we need a war leader, uh, sometimes we need a cool head for diplomatic negotiations, and oftentimes women uh, served in most of these roles not usually as war chief, although there were some, there were some uh, battle-hungry mamas as well. Uh, but it is, uh, I, I would say that she's sort of, I mean, she, she does want to, argue, doesn't she, that, that no single religion is true over every other one. That there is a kind of uh, cultural relativity that Franz Boas and other 
early anthropologists were trained to respect that, that one culture is not superior to another culture, it's simply different. And, uh, but in the white hierarchical sense, we have a superior culture, we have one true culture, typically it's white, and uh, everything else is lesser. And uh, in this novel, she, she uses this transformation and this sort of uh, having, having the Christian widen his religious views in order to suggest that there's something of value in all the religions of the world. And we simply have to be open enough and receptive enough to, um, and curious enough uh, to find out what all those different belief systems are like. And she also suggests that more is better, that if you can experience the world as both a man and a woman, you're, you're enlarged as a spiritual being. And same with uh, in the religious sense as well. Yes, thanks. You're a good audience.